to the health of your app. I am going to show you today how to turn Gradle into putty in your hands. It will do exactly what you want it to do. Your builds will be the envy of all your coworkers. Who here has ever wanted to do something with their build with Gradle but stopped for some reason because they were either too frustrated, it took too long, or they didn't think they had the time? And for those of you that didn't put up your hand, I'm going to show you some things that are going to make you want to run out of this room and t code them as soon as possible. Welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Josh Allen and I have been mentoring and helping people understand Gradle for many years. Today we're going to be talking about Gradle. This is the build system that we've been all been using for many years. But why? What is so great about Gradle? Well, you're going to know after this talk if you don't know already. I'm going to help you decipher its syntax. So often you look at a Gradle file and it looks like a configuration file. I'm going to show you that it's so much more than that. I'm going to show you the life of a task. What about a task? Usually the first time you code a, a task, it just doesn't work the way you think it should. You have some mental model of how it's supposed to work and it works a different way. So I'm going to help you uh, figure that out, what's going on there. I'm going to show you some best practices in terms of code organization. Where do you put your uh, build logic? I'm going to show you some delicious tasks, tasks that are going to make you mouth water. And then I'm going to help you build up your own wizard toolbox, your own tasks that you want your build to be doing. So why Gradle? Well, let's go back for some historical context. What were people doing at the dawn of time? They were using build scripts. Dawn of time, there was nothing around, so they started using build scripts. Then in 1976, what happened? Make. Someone got sick of all those dependencies that just didn't work sometimes, and actually they built it over a weekend. And it worked very, very, pretty well. I mean, if anyone has in this room has actually used it for any length of time, you know it's very finicky. But it worked good enough. Good enough to last 24 years until Ant. And believe me, if you were working with Make and then you got Ant, it was like the best thing since sliced bread. Like this was just such an amazing tool and you're so happy to use it and you're never turning back. In fact, you probably became pretty loyal to Ant. And then you started hearing people talk about, you know, Ant is so imperative. And there's this big philosophical war between imperative and declarative programming. And the declarative side came out with Maven. And then there was basically a philosophical war between Ant and Maven. It still lasts today. Maven kind of did end up winning out in the end. However, if you ever used Maven on any real projects, what ends up happening? Something goes wrong and you can't figure out what in the world's going on with it and it just is broken. So Maven, because of its declarative syntax, had this issue where if it was working and you were using the, uh, basically it's called configuration by convention, other programming languages or other tools like Ruby on Rails has a similar issue where it works great when you follow the convention, has a steep learning curve because you have to know what the convention is, and then it can ha uh, cause problems when it doesn't work. As well as, it's kind of hard to do imperative programming in Maven, so if you want to just write a simple script that does some uh, basically general purpose programming language, it can have some issues. But it worked fine. Then, Gradle came out in uh, 2007. It was ha wasn't very popular, in, at least in my circle, until uh, Android took it over. Maybe in your circle is a bit different, but I know I, I didn't really quite hear about Gradle until uh, it, until uh, Google adopted it uh, for uh, Android. So what makes Gradle different is that it is both imperative like Ant and as well as declarative like Maven. I'll get into that later. 
So, let's talk about Gradle. What is Gradle? Well, Gradle is a domain-specific language that's, that's written in Groovy. So you may not, if you're very new to Android programming, you may not realize that when you look at a Gradle script, it's actually a Groovy code. It's just, syn it's just structured in a way using Groovy syntax such that it looks like a configuration file. So it's basically a Groovy programming language hidden to make it look like a configuration file. We'll get into exactly how it does that later. So the main, so the documentation has gotten a lot better over the years. Oh, wrong one. There we are. Documentation has gotten a lot better over the years. So all of the Gradle domain specific language is, uh, that is on this website, or a lot of it is. So that, this is written by the Gradle team. Then there are, um, <coughs> sorry, then there are plugins that are written by various third parties, including the Android plugin that's written by the Google Android team. So if you ever wonder why there's documentation in two different places when you're trying to organize your, your when you're trying to look up how to do something, it's because one is the one of the plugins, there's many plugins, and one is the core Gradle. So anything in like org.gradle is written by the Gradle team, and then there's a plugin package for Android and the Android plugins and so forth. So that kind of gives you the overall landscape of, of Gradle. So it definitely is something to be excited about. All right, let's talk about deciphering its syntax. Now, what I'm talking about here is groovy syntax, because it's one and the same. When you're looking at a Gradle file, you're just looking at groovy's um, structured a certain way. So, um, one of the main things that makes groovy such a language that's really good at for writing a domain specific language is closures. Closures are a little bit different than functions and lambdas, which you guys are very familiar with. I'll just give you a quick example. Here's a, a <laughs> lambda that just converts the power of two of a number. So those curly brackets with the little arrow, which I'm sure you're familiar with, that's just giving parameters and multiplying i by itself. This is another one. It's basically given the tagline of our favorite province. Um, you can see here that the return statement is optional. The first lambda doesn't have a return statement. The second one does. This, again, this optional syntax actually does help uh, Gradle to hide it uh, to, um, to be used as a domain-specific language. All right, so now we're going to get into something about closures that is the magic sauce that makes it work for a DSL or domain specific language. And that is delegates. Delegates are the thing that just, it basically makes you help understand the syntax of Gradle once you understand delegates. So here we just got a class, and a, sorry, two classes, a person and a thing. We're basically instantiating to instantiating uh, each of them we're creating a new closure and this you can see this delegate keyword delegate.name.to uppercase so delegate is a keyword in groovy uh, it's similar to this so there's this owner and delegate so there's there are three related uh, objects so here i'm saying take the delegate of my closure get the name property of that object and then call to uppercase on it. And then here you can see the magic of the delegate changed. So you can say we're the first we're set the delegate to the person, and you can see that it's equal to Toronto. And then you're going to set the delegate to the thing. You can see that it's equal to Android. So that may not make much sense as to how this is going to tie into. Gradle, but it's important to understand this key concept because it uh, explains a bit what's going to happen next. Okay, so let's see delegates in action. So you've written this a thousand times. Basically, looks like a Gradle configuration file. You got your Android, 
default config, you're setting the application ID. What in the world is this doing? Well, what is it doing? It's calling this method on this um, base base extension. It's calling this method on base extension uh, called default config. And you can see at the very end, it's see where it says delegates to. Delegates to default config from default config. So that's a property. Uh, default config is another class. So essentially, the Android in the first sorry so Android is the uh, base extension, right, that has a property or function called default config. And the way that works, because remember I talked about optional return statement, Gradle also has optional brackets. So when you don't, any function that has takes a closure, you just can, it's similar to Kotlin, if you guys are familiar with Kotlin, you just drop the brackets and you just add the closure on the end, it passes the closure to the function name. Um, it's a little bit more clear, I think, if you see it in Java. So this is the same uh, function declaration written in Java, it basically takes an action, which is a function that takes, uh, does it take a parameter? Uh, yeah, uh, it's a function that takes a parameter, and in that case, it takes a default config. And then here you can see the definition of default config, and it has an application ID property. So that's essentially how to deconstruct what's happening in that um, in that uh, snippet of code that we've all seen a thousand times. Actually, lately, I think starting in 3.0, I've really noticed it, is you when you go command click in your Android Studio, you can really follow these things around, so it really helps you out. All right, what about this one? All seen this, apply plugin, you know, Android plugin, apply from, this is you got your, your, your Groovy script, so what is this doing? Well, this is using the key value syntax of Groovy, Basically, it's calling this function apply, which is on the plugin aware, a plugin aware class, and it basically takes a map. So that's interesting. So the key, the plugin is the key, and com.android application, that is the value. And it passes that, it creates a map, and passes that with the, that key values into the function. So that's, that's basically what's happening there. I can see by the looks on the audience, some people are like, "Wow, I've never seen that before." Some people are like, "Yeah, get on, get on with it." But it's, we're, I hope there'll be something in here for everyone. So here you can see that this uh, function uh, uh, in the description it tells you what it can take. So here it has a from, a plugin, and a two. I actually didn't know about two until very recently. So you can change what it's applied to. Okay, so now this is advanced course. This is for the, all the people that thought they knew everything about Gradle. Okay, you think you know something? Tell me how extension works. What's going on here? Look at this syntax. We have a, now this is an extension property, so lots of objects in Gradle have this, um, including project. So you're, uh, you're basically adding my compiler, my compiler version and my tool version to an extension property similar to a map. But how does this syntax make any sense? Because you're assigning a value. Like if it was a key value, I would understand it, but the assignment. And then this is how you use it. You just say, you just uh, root project.extension and then you can put the variable name. So imagine you put the first was in like your root project, your root build.gradle, and then the next one you used in your in your sub-project, sub-module. So this works by a little trick because Gradle has property accessors which essentially remove the get in the set of any of any uh, get and set method, so it's just a property accessor. So uh, they, they're doing something very similar to this, or exactly this actually 
where they have a get, just a plain get method, and just a plain set method. Here I am just storing it in a hash map. And this is, so that's the my extension property, this is the class. Then we have the instance. Then we have the closure. Now this is the magical part of the whole thing. There's actually two magical parts. The first magical part is the get and the set. The second magical part is the ch where they're changing the delegate on the closure. So the third line from the bottom, closure.delegate equals my extension instance. Then they change the resolve strategy. So this is another thing about delegates where you can tell it how to resolve unknown messages. So by default, it goes to, I remember it said there was three, there was this, owner, and delegate. By default, it goes to this. You can change it to go to delegate first. There's a few other more advanced usages, but usually you only use default or delegate first. And then you call the closure. What does that mean? That means that in that extension bracket, it's basically calling this function. So here we say my extension, we're setting the tagline. It doesn't know about tagline, it's, it's passing, it's resolving, the delegate's resolving that, it's going to the get method, passing and tagline as the, so it's essentially like an empty method call, um, it's passing tagline as the name, and then we're getting it from the instance at the end there. So, don't ever do this, just leave it for the extension object, but it's, it's nice to know that there is an answer as to how it works. So let's review what we've seen so far. So this is, uh, these are the things that help gr turn Gradle into a domain specific language. So one is the closures. Uh, the, the next is the delegates, how you can change the delegates and the resolve strategy, as well as uh, how things are uh, resolved. So there's, when you're in your Gradle file, there's an implicit resolution so on the actual project. So if you're on the root project, and you normally say you want the root project's name, you would say root project.name, but it would also work if you just put name. Because it would say, oh, I don't know, I don't know who, who does this name message belong to? And it would uh, go to the project first. Optional brackets, optional return statements, optional semicolons, so these are all things that help Gradle hide it look like a configuration language. Property accessors, so this is turning Java get and set methods to just uh, property accessors similar to Kotlin. And then the key value syntax. <coughs> so no magic. Okay, life of a task. So when you first start coding in Gradle, tasks just don't make any sense. You think it's like you're coding in a programming language, but things get executed when you don't expect them to be executed and vice versa. So first thing that happens is when you're creating a task, it gets configured, and then it has the do first and do last blocks. So this is all you really need to understand to understand defining tasks. And I think this, is a, this has been a big mental block for people as to, I'm writing a task, why is it executing? I didn't tell it to execute. It's because they didn't put something in the do last or do first block. So here we have a task. Um, the print line, this always prints, that I find is a confusing for people. Um, that's because it executes as part of the configuration. So in here, this is where you uh, would configure the task. Here, this is just extending default task, but you could have it extend like a jar task. And in this block, this is where you would set the source directories and the name and so on. And then the do last, when you're creating your t custom tasks, this is where you put your logic. So if you want to put any kind of programming logic, you usually put it in the do last block. And this usually clears up uh, the confusion for people once they understand that. Okay, so what are some uh, useful lifecycle methods? Project.afterEvaluate. Now, what, what is this for? Well, often tasks aren't available right away. 
So if you're in your root project and you want to um, know something about its Android configuration in order to do something about it, it hasn't been configured yet because the project hasn't been evaluated. So you want to do all that stuff in the after evaluate method. It's a very handy method when you when you expect um, something to be ready in Gradle and it's and it's not. Uh, task when added, this is the, uh, sometimes you want to add a dependency on a task. So you want to say, I want this task to be dependent on another task. And you can't figure out when to do that because it, the project hasn't been evaluated or it has been evaluated, but it's still not available. So use task when added and just wait for that task to be added and then, and then do something on that task. So here's a, uh, like for example, I, in th we had a situation where we needed to do something after all of the sub-projects were evaluated. So we needed to wait for every, all the projects to be evaluated and then um, it was for a Kotlin documentation task. So what did we do? Well, create a simple function that takes in the list of a uh, collection of projects. So this we just would get from like root project at sub projects. And we pass in a closure. Don't be afraid to create closures on, on your functions. They're just essentially like a listener uh, pattern. They can often be used as listener patterns. They're pretty easy. And we're just basically saving the remaining projects. It saves all the projects. We loop through all the projects. We wait. We add an after evaluate block. Once it's been evaluated, we remove it. We remove it. We wait until there's no more remaining projects, and then we call the on all evaluated. Now, there is something strange about this block of code that you normally wouldn't think you needed to add. It seems a bit out of place, and that's def my sub project equals sub project. Why? Why you already have sub project? Why are you saving it locally? It's another unique thing about closures. So in Java, you would have to save a sub project as a final variable in order to pass it into an anonymous class. Groovy doesn't have that limitation with uh, closures, but it does have other consequences. The other consequence is that sub project keeps getting changed. So the <clears throat> what ends up happening is that you only wait for the final um, the final sub project to execute. It essentially doesn't save the uh, value in a variable. This keeps getting changed. So the line, the remaining projects dot remove my sub project is always pointing to the last one. So it it, uh, it doesn't work. So that's why that little one of the things you want to be uh, you're gonna have to be a little bit careful with when you use when you use closures because they're different than anonymous classes or a lambdas in Kotlin. All right, so, so let's go into some, uh, some ideas about code, code organization. So there's a few different ways of using co code org to organize your code. Uh, let's go through some of them. The first place you're gonna do is just create a function to do something. So you have, sometimes it's very helpful to just um, put some uh, core logic in a function and save that in the same build script. Uh, very useful. Another way is once you sometimes when you do that you want to store it in your uh, just a, another Gradle file and then call apply from so that's also very useful. So these are like an order of I find commonality so there are issues with storing it in Gradle files which I you'll run into once you do it like You'll fit. You'll be like, how do I expose this function from uh, my Scradle file? So I call apply from, and I want to use the values from that. An easy way to do it is to use the extension object. Uh, just just add add anything you want to export to the extension object, and then you can use it in your the calling Gradle script. There can be other problems with it though, like. Dependency management can be a bit uh, flaky, so uh, so this is good. Just if you ever run into problems, um, move on to some of the other methods. 
Uh, you can put things in a class. Interesting thing about, about um, creating classes versus functions. In functions, you can use uh, project um, instances, and in classes, you can't. So there's a, there's a barrier there. Um, these things you'll like you'll run into when you when you start using them, so it's not that important to remember them. Sometimes, if you get to the class level, I find that your s scripts are getting complicated enough that they need to be tested. So, if you want ever want to do unit testing, build source is a great place. If it, build source isn't that common of a place, but all it is is uh, another source directory that is available to all of your build scripts. And the great thing about build source is that when you add something to the test directory on build source, it automatically gets run and executed and verified as part of your build. So it's a great place to put yeah. uh, more complicated logic, more involved logic. Like we have some, yeah, we have some, we have, we have some use for it. And in init.gradle, this is another place to put your uh, enterprise-wide level settings. So this will um, run before your uh, any of your other um, like settings.gradle or your build.gradle file. So it's for like common common code. And if you're going to use init.gradle, I recommend going to the Gradle doc docs to see exactly how it should be used. Okay, so what settings.gradle is again an interesting um, interesting file in the sense that what is it doing here? It has this include, you know, you're including the different modules. By the way, I recommend splitting up your application code into different modules like this. It really helps you separate your dependencies and not have any circular time dependencies and it I find it leads to much uh, clearer application logic. But what is it doing? Well, it just so happens that settings.gradle is passed in just like your build.gradle is passed in a, a root project, your settings.gradle is passed in the settings object and it has this include method which is a var arg list of strings. So again, it's just a a simple Gradle file just like build.gradle, simple groovy file just like build.gradle. Okay, so if you haven't, if you don't know about build config, build config is a great way to bring values from the outside world into your, into, into your application. It basically adds things onto the uh, build config constant. Where do you, where do you, can you get these from? Well, I usually put things that should be checked in the source control in your gradle.properties. Things that should not be checked in the source control, I put the, it in local.properties and parse that. You could put it in your home gradle properties that's not checked in the source control, but you can lead to conflicts with different, um, uh, different instances. Um, all of your Gradle builds will still pull from the same Gradle home, so I recommend putting it in uh, the local properties. This is the same file that says do not modify because Android Studio created it. Don't worry about modifying it. Uh, and to add the actual build config, just use this uh, build config field in your settings, in your uh, build file. Now, for things that should not be in source control, like API keys, um, key store passwords, stuff like that, I recommend putting them in a like a secret dot properties that you parse the same way as local properties and just store it in a known location. Or I usually store the location in like Gradle dot properties file, and that's good useful for build uh, CI servers as well. So that's some, that's a general idea of like build organization and some best practices around how to organize your build logic. Let's see what kind of tasks we can get, going to make our mouth water. So the first thing is static analysis. Now this is pretty dry, so just bear with me, but every project usually runs Android Lint. The only thing is people ignore the warnings. 
don't ignore the warnings. My advice is the difference between going from zero warnings to one warnings is a lot. The difference between going from 100 warnings to 201 warnings is never noticed at all. So if you're going to even bother running Lint, just spend the time to get your warnings down to zero. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. Uh, so find bugs or detect. These are another static analysis tools. If you haven't implemented these in your builds, probably it's just because you don't think you have the time. It's actually not that much time once you get down into it. There's some there's sometimes some momentum to get going, but once you once you do it, you're happy that you that you did. So I recommend doing it as early as possible. And again, just get the warnings down to zero. Um, it might take like might take a day to do it, but it'll be worth it in the end or longer. So we have as well as a check style or KT lint on Kotlin. These are just make sure your formatting is correct. Again, a lot of people know about them. But for some reason, they just have this barrier. Oh, I don't have the time to do it. Just do it. And code coverage. Now, this can be, um, this is a bit more challenging, but it can be very rewarding. And in my experience, it's the only way to ensure that your code coverage stays high. Basically, what you do is you set the threshold to the baseline, and you just keep cranking it up and ratcheting it up the code coverage. I find otherwise, um, yeah, other, otherwise it's really hard to enfor enforce code coverage. Um, some people don't even do unit testing, but I like it a lot. Okay, what about some, uh, you want to, let me, I don't want to scare you with this slide, okay. So imagine you have, so you're doing unit testing and you have a utility module and you want to share some test code. Um, so you have something in your utility test f uh, folder and like a Kot um, RoboElectric base class or Kotlin base class, something like that, and you want to share the rest of your other modules. I just got to go through this again. So yeah, you want to share with the other modules. So you've tried a number of ways. One is you've tried changing source sets. So there's a source set property you may have, especially if you're using Kotlin, you have to change it to point the Kotlin directory. We can also point it to other, uh, other, you can point any directory you want. So you could point it to the other modules directory. So you do that, you find out that Android Studio has a lot of problems with it. Everything's showing up in red, it's really annoying. But you live with it, but then you can't, but then you're using Kotlin, you can't um, get access to in, internal variables, uh, sorry, internal classes because they're, because they're not in the same module. So this is uh, one way of doing it. So after evaluate, you're going to create this uh, test shared jar. It's a type jar, so this type um, again, what this is doing is this is creating a hash map and passing it to the caller of this task, um, this uh, task uh, function. That, and the create test share jar is uh, the name that's passed into the name property, which is a string. It's passed in a closure, so that's how to read that in Kotlin. And then it's doing it's in the configuration block, so it's telling you. So that depends on this is saying that. This task depends on the unit test to compile, and then the regular base name from and includes these are base. These are just uh, regular uh, jar tasks, and then the do last. So even after imagine you created this whole jar and that's great, but then you know when you do the command click on your favorite base test, it freaking goes to the jar. That's really annoying. So then you got to go manually set it up and point it to the actual source code, or you can just do it once and every time copy it over to your idea libraries file. So this creates the jar, updates the libraries file. Then in the app build.gradle, which is actually using the test, we our dependencies, by the way, compile and Compile was changed between to implementation and API, which was very useful in the last uh, Gradle version. So implementation means only my module has access to those dependencies. One of the weird things about Gradle was that if you one of your sub projects 
had a compile dependency. All modules had access to that compile dependency. It makes sense with the JVM, but it was a bit annoying. So implementation in API gets rid of, uh, fixes that. And now uh, test implementation. So these are dependencies for test. It's saying that the for the for did it do? yeah. So the it's so basically getting the build directory of utility with the known location of the jar. And then this is, and then tasks when added. So this is what I was talking about before when it's waiting for a task to be added so it can make it depend on something. It's basically making it depend on another module's uh, task. So there, so that's like some, some of the uh, lessons learned where you're like, you like, you know it should be possible, but you're not quite sure how. Understanding how Groovy and Gradle works allows you to navigate a documentation a lot easier to, to figure it out. Because you're not going to find this on Stack Overflow. Um, so, oh, I don't want to get ahead of, oh yeah, no, that's okay. Okay, so everyone here probably knows that IntelliJ has a really good inspection tool called uh, Inspect. So you go to analyze, inspect code, and it, it does all this other stuff that Android Lint uh, doesn't do. Um, Here's some examples of, you know, X, Android XML element is not allowed, um, or image without content description. So it's, uh, it's pretty great. Wouldn't it be nice if it was part of your build as well, part of your automated build? Well, just do it. Yeah, um, yeah. you basically just created an Android Studio Inspect task. They do uh, include with Android Studio an, an Inspect script, which allows you to run it. And then it th this will just, so you can see here the executable Android Studio Home slash content slash bin slash inspect.sh. So that's the location of the inspect file on Mac. It's obviously not bad on Windows. And you pass in a few parameters that it needs and then it, and then it runs. There will be more tasks required to parse the results. And it's not 100% perfect because big annoying limitation with inspect. or Android Studio is you can only have one instance running at a time. So uh, you'd have... There's ways of getting around it. You have to basically pretend that it's a different version of the Android Studio that you have in your different version of Android Studio than you have running. So yeah, so essentially that we, what we've shown is a, a lot of static analysis tools and um, shared test code, and there's more stuff coming. <coughs> So let, let's see what did you know? What does some wizards know in terms of their toolbox? Well, performance. So Gradle performance. The what is all? Almost all of Gradle performance is based on not running a task a second time. So basically, almost everything is basically about caching result once and then reusing it, and that is based on the up-to-date when property of any task. So you don't really need to know the specifics of how this works, but it does, if, if you're, it's the key to understanding what makes a, what makes a task decide that it needs to run again or not run again. It's this up-to-date when property that it has. So if you, sometimes you'll create a custom task and it won't run again, and you're like, that's weird. And it's because this up-to-date when property is returning true when it should be returning false. <coughs> uh, parallel is an in, is an incubating feature, which, when you're running multi-project builds, it will run them all at the same time if they don't have dependencies on each other. So it's very handy. Like clean will just like clean all the directories at once. There's there's some requirements that are easy to meet.
There's a requirement that's easy to meet, which just means in your sub-modules, don't reference brute project at sub-project. As long as you don't do that, parallel is going to work just fine. Uh, configure on demand is another optimization, which basically is also incubating, which basically stops the uh, module from being um, configured unless it's going to absolutely be used. I haven't seen much performance improvement from this, but it's one of the, there's only a few things you can do to improve uh, Gradle performance, and this is one of them, so you might as well, might as well turn it on. And then the build cache, this is uh, relatively new, and what that does is basically reuse results um, uh, even after a clean. So if you clean, it'll still cache some results. What it also allows you to do is, uh, if you have a CI server, you can uh, have the CI server push its cache results onto like an H one of one of your internal dev boxes, and everyone downloads the cache results from the dev boxes. This uh, for this time that uh, for the time that Android builds for new projects. Sorry for. Um, freshly checked out projects. I don't see a lot of benefit for, for this. This I feel like the remote uh, caching is more for people with very large uh, like projects that have uh, dependencies that al always aren't rebuilt. Um, so like if you have like very very long builds then remote build cache can help but I feel if your builds are only three minutes it's a it's a bit overkill. And something cool that came out in uh, I think 4.1, but it's it's enabled by default in 4.5, is scan. So 4.5 is the latest Gradle came out uh, a little while ago. So what does scan do? Scan. All you do is you just add dash dash scan onto your build, and it will. Um, it will compile all of the uh, timing for all of the build and upload it to a server. So it ends up looking something like this. This is it asks you, "Hey, I want to upload it. Do you accept the do you accept the terms of service?" You you can also add yes to the build Gradle file and do it automatically, and then it gives you a link. And then you click on the link. You go to your email confirmation and then you get something that looks like this. This is just one portion of it. So you can say, hey, why did that, you know, what what were the tasks that were taking so much time in that build? So here we can say uh, capped generate stubs debug Kotlin. So capped is the annotation processor for Kotlin. And it thinks that it wasn't up to date. And the reason why this was strange was because it was up to date. Like I just ran assemble debug and then I ran assemble the debug again. It's telling me it wasn't up to date. What in the world's going on? So scan help with that. It's saying that um, it's saying that my build config has changed. And I'm like, how does my build config change when I just did literally nothing? I just ran assemble twice in a row. So this was definitely helpful. You can see that it started the time that it started at uh, the duration was 44 seconds. You can. You try it out, and you can. It's very easy to try out. You can uh, see for yourself the kind of information that you can get. So then, this caused me to look at what was going on. Well, I realized someone was doing this. Someone was adding that build config, config field with the time. So it probably seemed. I mean, it got past code review, so it, was, it seemed innocent. But what it meant is that the build was always rebuilding. Um, so we just changed it so that it was uh, checking whether or not we should actually include the build time. And it only forces, so only like on our build server would we include include build time, and then locally you wouldn't have to rebuild every single time. So help with rebuilds. Uh, what are some other other things that you should know about? Uh, if you ever have dependency problems, for some reason I can never find this commands on Stack Overflow whenever I need to remember what it is. So it's 
project colon dependencies. Somehow I can, I'm like, I know there's a command somewhere, but I can't figure out what it is. But now, now I've done it enough that I remember now. Um, and it basically just lists all the dependencies and the versions. And if you have version conflict, it's a great place to go to figure out uh, what's, uh, what versions are conflicting. Um, doo -doo -doo. And so, again, you can use uh, Gradle to solve this for you. You just pass in, you can just create a, a map that has, hey, for this, uh, for this dependency, this is what I want my uh, version to be. In this case, we're using a version from this uh, root, from ex ex the extensions object and root project. And we're just, actually, this is um, exposing a method called override dependencies because it's on the extension. So this is one way to expose a method from a Gradle file to the caller. So we're just adding it to the extension extension object of the project. And yeah, so it takes a project where it again, can, um, configurations.all takes a closure, which we're passing in. Resolution strategy again takes closure for each dependency. Again, it's taking this closure and we're just basically setting it. If the version is different to the uh, sorry, if the if the dependency is within our map, then we just override the override the version. So pretty handy. So, what are some other exciting use cases? There's one is uh, you you can split the APK. So you may have uh, heard about this, and it may be something that you hear about, but ah, it's just. Is too much work. It's actually not that much work, although there are some annoying version numbering issues with splitting an APK. But you can easily take 10 megs off your uh, APK by use, by splitting it by um, do, 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 uh, screen densities. Because you're not, they used to, if you ever read the docs for triple X HDMI, they would say don't use triple X HDMI except for. Um, app icons, but they've removed that note, so I guess they have enough triple X HD by devices that they that you're supposed to include them now. So that can add a lot of a lot of size, especially you have uh, double X HDMI and triple X HDMI, but you're only going to you're only going to use uh, one set. So you can just put a, a play case. You can also do image optimization. So there's a way that you can um, figure out what the optimal uh, compression is for an image and still maintains its maintain its fidelity. There's some tools for doing that, so that's another uh, cool thing that you can do with your build. Uh, you can share strings between platforms, so you have uh, one source of truth for all your strings, and you just uh, reference that from uh, a script. We actually one of our projects we have it. The, the Gradle script creates the strings for iOS and Android, all in the same script, and it's it's very handy. So, so, so those are some of the things that you can uh, do. So we're getting we're getting to the summary. So first thing that I want you to remember is that you love Gradle. It is so amazing. And you're, it's just a joy, joy to be here. Actually, so Groovy is one thing. That, there's a, a Kotlin DSL now where they've uh, created a domain-specific language in Kotlin. I personally just like the, I find the Groovy one just prettier. Um, but yeah, that is, uh, it's, not, it's not only for Groovy. That's one of the amazing things about the JVM. Uh, Groovy is hidden in the domain-specific language. So it's hidden in the DSL. So, so just realize that you're dealing with a general purpose programming language, which gives you a lot of power, and go and do uh, great things. So, thank you. Good night.